Alright, imagine this scenario. You just got a new game and you're playing through the first few levels or the tutorial or whatever's applicable. The amount of game mechanics you have to learn is a bit overwhelming at first, but you know enough of the basics to at least progress through it. As you continue playing, more and more mechanics that you have to learn are introduced, and the game only gets harder and harder. This should make you want to play the game less, but you continue anyways, learning the new mechanics and getting better at them, and as you do, you experience a moment where everything just clicks. If you've ever watched a game design video before, there's a pretty decent chance that you've heard of the term flow. Now, for the uninitiated, flow state, or the colloquial term, being in the zone, refers to when a player's skill perfectly matches the game's difficulty level, as seen on this graph I found on Google Images. When a player is in a flow state, the game they're playing has their whole undivided attention. They become totally engrossed in the task, and time seems to fly by without their knowledge. Not only that, but they also tend to play at their most optimal level and perform better than they do at any other time. Unsurprisingly, the most amount of fun a player can experience is usually found when they're in a flow state, and is generally something that good game designers should work to achieve. For most games, at least. But of course, that just begs the question, how do you even get a player into the flow state? Well, that's actually a really complex question, one which many, many, many scientists have tried to answer, and while I don't have a comprehensive understanding of the flow state, I've done enough research to be able to determine the most important factors for a game designer to consider. So let's start with the most important one, that being... Come on, I just said that flow is when a player's skill perfectly matches the game's difficulty level, of course this is gonna be the most important factor. If your game is too easy, it can get way too boring for the player. Conversely, if it's stupidly difficult, the player will be so frustrated that they won't even want to play the game. Of course, there are exceptions to this, not every player is looking for the same experience, but generally, you want your game to hit that sweet spot where it's challenging, but still gives the player confidence in their abilities. That being said, balancing difficulty is much easier said than done. There's a lot of game design techniques that you'll have to use to do so, such as introducing new mechanics in a safe environment, second chance mechanics, creating an open beta for players to give feedback, and various other methods that are complex enough to have their own separate videos. One option that I'd like to mention is creating dynamic difficulty. Dynamic difficulty refers to when a game changes how hard it is according to a player's skill level. In multiplayer games, this is most often seen in MMR, or matchmaking rating. Basically, whenever you win a game, your MMR goes up, and whenever you lose, it goes down. By matching you up with people who have a similar MMR, you're ensured to play against people who are of a similar skill level as you, so that winning games is challenging, but doable. Assuming the MMR system works, of course. However, in single-player games, dynamic difficulty can take on a couple of different forms. The most common one is a simple difficulty select screen. Letting the players choose the difficulty of the game is an incredibly powerful tool, because if the player ever finds the game too hard or too easy, they can just change the difficulty setting. This can be done in more subtle ways as well, such as offering more difficult missions to a player that come with a higher reward, making choosing the difficulty a core part of the gameplay loop. But sometimes giving the player a choice isn't always the best idea. Oftentimes, inexperienced players will either be way too confident in their skills, or not believe in them at all, causing them to choose a difficulty that's either way too hard or mind-numbingly easy, neither of which are very fun. This gets worse if you're forced to choose a difficulty level before the game even starts, especially if you're not able to change it later. That's why games like Resident Evil 4, or the aptly named game Flow, automatically increase or decrease their difficulty according to how well you're doing. In doing so, they're able to ensure that the game always remains a fair challenge to the player. However, this can be pretty controversial if it's present throughout the entire game, especially if you don't tell the player. Dynamic difficulty is best when it's either explicitly told to the player, or incredibly subtle. Or both! My personal favorite example of this is in the game Pyre. In the game's competition sections, you're put into this 3v3 match against an AI where you try to get a ball into the opponent's pyre. You can do this by throwing the ball, but you can also do it by running directly into the pyre while carrying it. Doing so will net you a ton of points, but will also prohibit you from using the character who scored in the next round, acting as a sort of auto-balance. 
Throughout the game, you're also forced to get rid of your strongest characters for story-related reasons, forcing the player to constantly adapt. Pyre is an excellent example of dynamic difficulty in single-player games done right. With difficulty balancing out of the way, I can move on to the next topic, that being... Something that's arguably just as important as difficulty balance when it comes to establishing flow is having a clear goal for the player. Without a clear goal, the player will have no idea what they're trying to do, and then they'll just mostly end up wandering around. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, having an exploration-based game is fine, and it's still possible to establish flow in one, but it's generally much more difficult to do so compared to other genres. As much as I love Outer Wilds, it's not really a game where you can easily establish flow, since a lot of the time you're just exploring, hoping to find some sort of clue to progression. I'm not trying to spoil the game though, so I won't talk about it more. There can't be a single hint of vagueness for what the player is trying to accomplish, whether that be making it to the end of the screen, extracting a package, or just getting a high score. Keep in mind that this doesn't necessarily mean you need to spoon-feed the solution to the player. Take this screen in Celeste, for example. I know that my ultimate goal is to make it to the end of the screen, that's generally how platformers work, but I can't immediately tell what I need to do to get there. But I do know that this gap is way too big for me to cross without a dash, so I'll have to use one to get across. And I also know that I have to use my dash to get over this wall, so I'll need to refill it, presumably using this dash crystal. Even though this isn't a particularly hard room to figure out, the goal is still clear and the game trusts the player to figure out how to achieve it. Sometimes, players can even make their own goals for themselves, such as trying to get through a level without killing a single enemy, or trying to beat the game as fast as humanly possible. Even sandbox games can have goals if the player makes them, like trying to make your redstone machine as efficient as possible. If you're scared that the goal you give to players is too easy, give them the tools to make their own new goals. As long as there's something for the player to do, they'll be spending more time actually playing the game, and less time aimlessly messing around hoping something happens. Unless it's a puzzle game, that's kind of the whole point. Of course, even if you have a clear goal, you'll also want to make sure the player knows how close they are to reaching that goal, meaning that you'll have to make sure there's plenty of... Clear goals tell us what we're doing. Immediate feedback tells us how to do it better. That quote's not by me, it's actually by this guy, who, by the way, was a massive resource for me while researching this video. Knowing your goal is great, but it doesn't help much if you don't actually know how close you are to achieving it. With immediate feedback, players are able to gauge how well they're doing so they can adjust how they play accordingly. Now, in all honesty, this one is incredibly simple, and isn't even much of a problem for most game genres, as most forms of immediate feedback are just naturally ingrained into the gameplay without the developer having to think much about it. For example, let's say that I'm trying to beat that one Celeste screen I was talking about earlier. I try to cross the gap without using a dash, but fail to do so. The game immediately tells me what I did wrong by showing Madeline dying. In doing so, the game creates this loop where whenever I make a mistake, it tells me so that I can avoid it in the future, but at the same time, whenever I do something right, the game rewards me by taking me to a new screen. The key word here is immediate. If the feedback is too delayed, players can make mistakes such as forgetting to water their crops and not realize the mistake until several hours later. This can also work the other way around, where a player does something well, but since they aren't aware that what they just did was good, they're less likely to repeat that action. This is notoriously present in simulation and strategy games. You can make one small decision at the beginning of the game and not realize how it affected things until much later on. While delayed feedback may be part of the fun of strategy games, it's also one of the huge barriers that's stopping people from getting into them. If feedback is ever delayed, there usually has to be a pretty good reason for it. Oh wait, that's Outer Wilds again, I'm not supposed to show this. Immediate feedback can come in many other forms as well, whether that be a health bar, experience points, or even just how far right on the screen you are. The important thing is that they remain subtle enough so as not to break up pacing. When I die in Celeste, the death animation is fairly quick, and I can intuitively reason not just that I failed, but also how I failed. The game doesn't pull up a text box explaining to me exactly what I did wrong or what I need to do to succeed. Doing so would break up the pace of the flow and be a huge distraction, which leads on to the next segment. The game managed to get the player into the flow state. Nice, now they're having even more fun than they would have outside of it. Now all that needs to be done is to keep them in that state, and in order to do that, you need to keep them focused. 
The first and most obvious step is to eliminate all distractions. That means no new complex mechanics for the player to learn, no extended quote-unquote break periods between action, and absolutely no long text boxes that the player can't just skim over to understand. If you include any of these things, they need to be quick enough or easy enough to understand so as not to break up the pacing. Throw a new enemy at the player and they'll be just fine, they'll just have to quickly adapt to its moveset. But throw a new mechanic or move that takes time to learn and master, and now you have to go through the trouble of re-establishing flow all over again. This is also where the quality of the feedback is really tested. A classic example of bad feedback is seen in Ocarina of Time. The first third of the game is notorious for Navi's constant hints towards the player. Like, yeah Navi, it's cool that I now know how to climb these vines, but did you really have to freeze the game and waste my time telling me? This could have been made a lot quicker and she did it again. But this is also Ocarina of Time we're talking about, a game which despite being over two decades old, I still sink hundreds of hours into thanks to speedruns and randomizers, so it gets a pass. An extremely simple, but very effective example of feedback that doesn't take away from focus is from a small indie game that I've never talked about on this channel before, and I'm personally very excited- It's Celeste again. If you die, it takes less than a second to respawn, and if you succeed, it takes less than a second to take you to the next screen. This definitely isn't exclusive to Celeste, in fact, most developers just intuitively know to make animations that are played a lot relatively short, but it's still a really good example. Once all distractions are eliminated and the player is fully focused on the game, the flow state can still be enhanced even further. One of the best ways to do this is by having immersive music accompany the gameplay. I don't really know too much about music theory, so I can't really talk much about this, but I'm pretty sure you can tell why this... ...is much more immersive than this. Wait, that's more Outer Wilds gameplay, I can't show the- And if having an incredible OST to accompany the game isn't enough, you can take it a step further by making the music adapt according to what's happening on the screen, also known as dynamic music. A noteworthy example of this is in Breath of the Wild, where the battle music varies greatly depending on the situation. This is me fighting a Bokoblin. And this is me fighting a Lynel. And this is me fighting a Lionel and winning. The battle music in this game changes depending on the strength of the enemy, type of weapon you're using, and whether or not you're actually hitting the enemy, furthering the immersion of the already atmospheric music. Unsurprisingly, rhythm games are also really good examples of games with dynamic music. I mean, it's a rhythm game, I would hope that music plays a pretty important role. Incorporating satisfying visual and sound effects into feedback also achieves something pretty similar to having dynamic music. Again, I'm not a visual or sound designer, but I mean, just look at this. I don't even know how to explain why, but something about seeing all of the glowing effects and the hit sound going up in pitch is just entrancing. It's stuff like this that makes games so fun to play. Oh yeah, speaking of which, fun is incredibly important. The player may be able to perform optimally when playing a game, but if they're not enjoying it, then they can't really be considered to be in the flow state. This one should be incredibly obvious, so obvious that I'm not going to dedicate an entire section of the video to it like I did last time. Yeah, I read the comments you guys leave. Stop complaining about the same things over and over, I know I made a mistake, I'm not a perfect- in short, in order to create flow in games, you need to balance difficulty to meet the player's skill level, make sure that the player has a clear goal to work towards, give them frequent feedback on what they're doing right and wrong, keep them focused on the game with things such as dynamic music and removing text, and of course, make sure they have fun. So, once you have all of these factors in a game, what does the final product look like? Well, to answer that, I'd like to bring attention to a small indie rhythm game called Overpass. Overpass is an indie rhythm game released in 2019 where the main gimmick is that the notes you have to hit appear on objects in the background, forcing you to pay attention to the scenery. It is by no means a perfect game, especially when it comes to performance issues and its weird leveling system, but this game establishes a sense of flow that is by far better than any other game I know. 
First off, it ticks all of the boxes for a game that establishes flow. It's challenging while not being too difficult, has a clear goal, immediately tells you if you made a mistake or did something right, and its biggest strength, it demands the full focus of the player and puts them in this almost zen-like state of mind. It does this by taking full advantage of what the notes appear on, or the note highway, if you will. A lot of the notes are just impossible to react to or even notice, especially when they're on quickly moving objects like this windmill. But that's because you're not supposed to always be able to see them. As you play, you'll start to realize that the background objects move and look in a way that corresponds to what note you're supposed to play. By the time you make this realization, the game starts taking full advantage of it, throwing levels at you where you have to rely on your own intuition and quick thinking to identify the correct notes, all while providing atmospheric music and an incredible aesthetic. I don't really know how to end this video, so I'll end it by saying if you're decent at rhythm games and you're looking for a game that puts you into a trance-like state, you should definitely go by Overpass. The sense of flow it creates is pure perfection, and it's also just really fun. There was also another game that I wanted to suggest at the end of this video, but I completely forgot what it was and now I'm kinda sad. I remember that its name sounded kinda similar to Overpass though, it was something like over... outer... Oh yeah, Outer Wilds! Go play Outer Wilds right now!